Imagine building your dream house and filling it with everything you ever wanted, then never getting a chance to enjoy it. Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to This House. Today we are exploring Elm Park in Norwalk, Connecticut. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. In 1820, LeGrand Lockwood was born into a humble family. His father Benjamin was a cobbler in the small town of Norwalk, Connecticut, where his ancestors had settled nearly 200 years earlier. Benjamin had a reputation as an honest man and taught his sons to value integrity above all else. At this time, New York City was booming, so the family relocated to Brooklyn and opened up a clothing store. In no time at all, they had grown their business from a brick and mortar to become one of the largest traders of textiles in the state. Legrand saw other opportunity in New York. Textiles did not interest him, but numbers did. So he broke away from his family business to become a stockbroker. He was known not only to be business savvy, but to be a trustworthy and charming man. His clients valued his honest advice, and in just a few short years, he climbed to the top of the industry. Because of his outstanding reputation, he was appointed the treasurer of the New York Stock Exchange. He then fell in love with and married Anne Louisa Benedict, and the young couple got busy growing their family to include eight children. During this time, the Lockwoods hired famed architect, Detlef Leno, to design for them New York City's very first Second Empire-style residence along Fifth Avenue. But they would soon have more work for the architect to do. Business was booming. The Civil War was breaking out, and Legrand saw an opportunity to multiply his wealth. He headed off to Europe to sell Union bonds. He was so successful at selling them that he returned as one of the wealthiest men in the United States and one of the country's very first multimillionaires. The Lockwoods began searching for the perfect place to build a summer home. Legrand returned home to Norwalk and found 30 pristine acres to purchase. He once again hired Leno to design a grand Victorian home that would be named Elm Park. It was composed of granite blocks nearly two feet wide and faced with ashlar. Intricate details varied across the facade, ranging from Gothic to Italianate. Altogether, the mansion boasted 62 rooms spread across 44,000 square feet. Passing through a rounded double door, you would enter the vestibule. Marble mosaic floors broke out into an array of geometric patterns. To one side, an urn stood centered on a semicircular window bay, barreling to join the groin vault ornamented with hand-stenciled floral motifs. Continuing on, the marble mosaics transformed into a more repetitive pattern as they spilled into the entrance hall, offset by marble columns supporting the coffered ceiling. The space dramatically opened to a two-story rotunda illuminated by an expansive skylight soaring overhead. To one end was the grand staircase, sweeping toward the marble floor, with newel posts supporting bronze figures triumphantly lighting the way. The rotunda doubled as an art gallery and held the Lockwood's prized possession, the painting Domes of Yosemite by Bierstadt. Legrand had commissioned this piece as a custom work in 1867 for the staggering price of $25,000, or the modern-day equivalent of nearly $500,000. The Lockwoods had a taste for fine art. Throughout the house, you will notice many small details worked into every surface. While the Lockwoods were planning their home, they spent time in Europe, hand-selecting furniture and art but they also wanted a level of craftsmanship that only old-world techniques could provide. While in Italy, they hired stonemasons and woodcarvers, masters of their crafts, to return with them to the United States. The artists collected rare and exotic materials on the Lockwood's behalf to have loaded into the ship that would take them to Connecticut. Once there, the artists lived in the house, working day and night until it was finished. This level of dedication to craftsmanship yielded truly unique and elegant features that make Elm Park distinguished. Seeing these details come together in the library is just one of the special places where art and architecture merge to create a space that was not only modern for the time, but also, in a sense, timeless. In stark contrast to the dark woods and furnishings, between two bookcases and beyond pocket doors was the conservatory. Its half-dome shape allowed light to flood in from all angles. Continuing on, the drawing room was fashioned in the Louis XVI style, with antique furniture set against painted wall panels. In the center, a chandelier stretched out to support globes, dangling with crystals below an intricately coffered ceiling. While appearing in old-world grandeur, the house was considerably modern. It had 14 bathrooms and 12 water closets in a time when most homes did not even have running water. 
Instead of yelling through the house or using chimes, speaking tubes were installed to communicate with staff across floors. Even below the house, a steam radiator was installed to keep the house warm on even the most frigid of Connecticut's winter nights. And in the summer, at the top of the house, giant vents could be opened using a series of pulleys to allow heat to escape the attic. Now that the house was finished, the Lockwoods could enjoy their state-of-the-art estate, or so they thought. In 1869, on a day known as Black Friday, Jay Gould notoriously cornered Wall Street. He had devised a scheme to raise the price of metal in the stock market and successfully knocked his competition into bankruptcy. Unfortunately for the Lockwoods, they lost nearly everything in the stock market that day and had to mortgage Elm Park. Legrand then caught pneumonia and died suddenly. His widow, Anna, was now stuck with a massive mortgage payment and no income. She scrambled to auction off everything she owned before the banks could seize it. She managed for a while, including selling much of her art collection to Henry Frick, but eventually, she was overcome by the mortgage payments. She abandoned the house and moved in with her son while the bank foreclosed on her. In 1876, Charles D. Matthews purchased the home from the bank for just $90,000, or the modern-day equivalent of about $2.5 million. He began restoring the home, including buying back much of the art and furnishings which had been auctioned off by Mrs. Lockwood. He spent years painstakingly putting the house back the way it was. Then, just as he was ready to live in it, he suddenly and unexpectedly died. An odd pattern seemed to appear. No one really got to enjoy the house for long before they died. Elm Park changed hands several times. As each owner died, it would be passed on to the next of kin in the Matthews family, until Lily Matthews had no one other than extended family to leave the house to. She willed Elm Park to a couple of her extended relatives who refused to live in the home. They leased it to the city, which later purchased it in 1941. Norwalk used Elm Park for offices and a few community events, but by the 1960s, it had fallen into disrepair. Permits were pulled to have the mansion demolished, but thankfully, in 1967, preservationists convinced the city to transform it into a house museum, and it has been open to the public for tours ever since. Over the years, it has been featured in several films, such as Stepford Wives and, in 2007, Elm Park received $6 million to carry out much-needed restoration work. If you have ever visited, I would love to hear about your experience below. And while you're there, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of This House. I would also like to extend a huge thank you to our This House supporters for joining the This House membership program to help make these videos possible. If you would like to see your name on the screen and support the production of these videos, please consider joining our membership program today. I'll see you next time on This House.